Hello everyone, welcome back to my picks for the top 5 entries in 2014's 7DRL contest. Um, last time we looked at Here Be Dragons, which was a browser-based roguelike um, almost entirely, if not in fact entirely, mouse-controlled. This time we're looking at another one, another browser-based roguelike, and again controlled by the mouse. And as I mentioned last time, I generally don't like browser-based roguelikes, and I don't like mouse-controlled roguelikes. So the fact that two of them, in fact, not just one, but two, have made it into my top five picks, should say something about the quality of them. Um, for the cynics among you, it may also say something about the quality of the other entries in this year's contest, but that's not really fair. There are a lot of good games from 2014's 7DRL contest, and I'll be looking at a few of the honourable mentions in coming videos. I probably won't do them one game per video as I've been doing with these. It'll probably be something like three or four games per video, but um, there are some that I want to give honourable mentions to that didn't make my top five, but are nonetheless worthy of a look. So this one is Lava Walker, which proudly declares itself a 7DRL14 game, although the font there actually makes it look a bit like it says a 7DRL44 game. It's way ahead of its time, or I guess way behind its time. Um, so, all the information you need is right here. Game by Storm Alligator, art by Pixelated Crown, but let's just ignore that and hit start. <laughs> Upon entering, probably the first thing you'll notice is that, hello, that sort of um, worms exclamation there. I, I can't be high-pitched enough to be a worm. Um, <laughs> not a sentence I ever expected to utter, but you know what I mean. So straight away you will notice not only the worms-esque vocal, but also the pixel art here. And the unexpectedly graphically lavish presentation for a roguelike. I mean, this looks good enough to be most sort of normal indie games. Like, you could see this for sale on Steam or Desura or something, but it's a 7DRL, and as such, it's free, as long as you have a browser. So anyway, here you are, I was just looking for you. As you know, the Yellow Dragon has returned. He's awakened the volcano. Eh, grammar can be a bit ropey, but that's to be expected. Um, I mean, again, as with all the 7DRLs, it's a seven-day project, so I think people don't generally prioritise proofreading every word of their written text. There are more important things to do, like making sure the game works. Um, so he's awakened the volcano and uses it as a nest to build a new army. In no time he'll be as strong as ever, and the rest of the world will stand no chance. As an aside on the language thing, a lot of 7DRL developers are also not native English speakers, so there's that. So don't be too hard on these games for um, not having flawless grammar. The lava that surrounds the volcano prevents us going to try and stop him before it's too late. There's a legend about an ancient relic that would allow us humans, apparently he's a human, despite looking like, I don't know, a Twinkie that's leaking at one end, which is a disturbing image. Um, we don't have Twinkies in this country, incidentally, but um, I've seen them in the United States. I ate one, and it was disconcerting. Like a, a long donut with cream in the middle, what's that about? Anyway, uh, looking for a relic that will allow humans to walk on lava so they don't need to be afraid of the... Um, you know, trying to confront the dragon in its volcanic lair. I would assume we probably have to confront the dragon eventually ourselves, but I've never got that far because, like most roguelikes, I tend to get killed. Although it's not as tough as some, at least as far as I've played. Um, but nonetheless, I do tend to get killed off. So, first things first. Hex-based movement controlled by clicking the mouse. Now, Bandicam tends not to record my mouse pointer, so you're not going to see where I'm pointing in all likelihood. But you'll be able to tell from where I'm moving. So we move around our little starting area like this, which, as you might expect, um, has a randomised layout each time you play. But here is the portal that that guy opened for us. So we need to head into this sort of outer realm to start... Hunting for the artifact. So we're heading to the Forest of Beasts. And sure enough, it is a forest full of beasts. In this case, something that looks like rabbits. Or 
a Twinkie that's sprouting at one end while also leaking. Hey, do you need arrows? You've come to the right place. I craft them. Just bring me Goatman's scalps and Goatman teeth. People who follow me on Twitter may have seen me posting pretty much this screenshot, or at least this conversation, and wondering how the hell he can craft arrows from scalps and teeth. What kind of arrow is that? I'm not going to be shooting that at a dragon. Do you want me to fail? I detect some sort of chicanery here. But anyway, go goat men's scalps and goat men teeth. And this guy um, sells us life potions in exchange for goat men teeth. And I like the reference here to the fact that trading you useful stuff for teeth makes no sense. It's the kind of thing that happens in MMORPGs a lot. It's not the last time I'm going to reference MMOs. Um, but it makes no sense, and I like the fact that there's a little nod to that here. Why I want teeth? That's none of your business. He has his own reasons for wanting goat men teeth. Um, and now I just can't help imagining some kind of rack of extracted goat men teeth on his wall in a back room. <laughs> I've been studying magic my whole life, and I've decided to share my greatness with the world. I'll sell you a charge spell for five Goatman scalps, and a push spell for two. Scalps are surprisingly hard to come by. Teeth aren't that bad, but scalps can be trickier. Yeah. Do you know you can hurt more than one enemy with only one swing of your sword? Just buy my Depth Strike spell and find out. Oh yeah, Depth Strike. I ask for five Goatman scalps in exchange. I was going to make an innuendous remark about Depth Strike, but I suddenly thought, hey, you're in your 30s, don't do that. Um, now, the layout of this village area is different each time, but the stuff that's available to you is the same. So you always have these spells available from people milling around, and you always have the guy who... Um, is offering to trade you life potions for teeth and all that kind of stuff. It's just the layout is different. So then we basically, we can pop up our map by clicking on the map lake picture in the top right. Um, so you can see the area where the blue dot is, is where we are now. And I think the other revealed area further over to the left is where we started off. So we've been transported halfway across the world by that portal. Um, so let's get going. Let's just pick a direction, start walking, see if we can kill some goat men. Now, I'm... Ooh, okay, here's a good illustration of something that we need to talk about. You'll see in the top right, next to the map picture, it now says fight mode. Previously, it said walk mode. In walk mode, you can move freely. You can click several hexes away, and you'll move across them. As soon as an enemy enters your range of vision you'll switch to fight mode, which basically means you can only move one hex at a time. So I, that's basically in place, I would assume, to avoid you accidentally rushing through combat and getting yourself killed. So you have to manage combat on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. Now, on the right side here, you'll notice there's a sword and an arrow. We only have one arrow at the moment, but if I pop my equipment over by clicking on the chest in the top left, you'll see sword, bow, arrow. You'll also see a teleport potion, which teleports us back to the portal, a life potion, which lets us recover 30 life, well, two life potions, and a sprint spell. I probably should have rearranged all this before we set off, but I was distracted. So we'll do that in a minute. But this is our inventory here. So, let's click on the arrow on the right. No one's in range, unfortunately. So we might have to return to that in a moment. So, for now, let's just reposition. And now they should be in range. So, let's shoot at this grey one that's closest to us by clicking on it. And our arrow went over there and is now lying on the floor. And we have to go over and pick it up. One thing that will sometimes happen is the arrow will just vanish. Um, they break, basically, with repeated use. Which is why you need to buy more from the guy who wants to make them out of scalps and teeth. Because they're actually a very useful feature, but they do have a habit of breaking. So let's move around here, and then just click on the enemy to attack with our sword. And he's dropped something there, so we'll move on to that space. And anything that's on the space is shown at the top there. So in this case, there's um, a gem of some sort. Let's pick that up. By clicking on it, the player picks up gem. And I think that's basically... Um, I don't know what that is, actually. I was going to say it seems like it's probably some kind of currency, but everyone wants teeth and scalps so far. So we'll pick up our arrow as well. And now we're back to walk mode, so we can move around freely like this. Now let's rearrange our inventory a bit. 
We've got teleport potion, so we'll assign that to the potion spaces in the top left, so we can click on them easily. And I'll add the sprint spell to active spells down here, and close my inventory. And you'll notice that the potions are displayed, but the spell is not. And the reason for that, if you can hear me over my neighbour's dog barking in the background, um, the reason for that is that spells, or at least the spell we have at the moment, becomes active only when you enter fight mode. So you'll see that popping up. There we go. You can see under the sword and the arrow we now have the sprint spell. So if we click on that, um, you'll see it has stamina cost of 3, cooldown of 2, and you move 2 tiles. So we click on that. And now we can move 2 tiles in a turn instead of 1. So let's lunge towards our enemy here. And attack. That was a goat man, but he didn't drop a scalp or a tooth. So we'll continue moving on until we find some that do. And I mentioned MMORPGs before, and I said it wouldn't be the last time I mentioned them. And this is the reason. Because the way that Lava Walker, at least as far as I've got with it, revolves around collecting bits from fallen enemies does remind me of MMORPGs. I've never played World of Warcraft, or indeed any of the paid ones, but I've played several of those free ones that tend to be made in Korea. And um, it definitely has that kind of thing going on here. So on the space we're standing on now, that one, there are some boots. I think they're boots. They look like severed 8-bit feet, so yeah. Boots with fire resistance of 5%, so let's put them in our boot slot. We don't have much else, no armour, no jewels. Jewels give you bonus effects, and of course you can find new weapons and stuff. Um, we're pretty low on health, so I'm going to actually use one of our health potions by clicking on it in the top left. There we go, mostly healed. But I find that I tend to use potions more quickly than I can afford to buy them. You know, um, the stuff I gain from fights forcing me to use one health potion isn't enough to replace that one health potion, so... That's usually what gets me killed. I run out of potions, essentially. Um, so, we'll just have a wander around. I think we can walk across this shallow water here. I guess this is meant to be deep water, since we can't walk on it. Okay, no more goat men at the moment. But this is basically how Lava Walker plays. And I can imagine that you might start to find the gathering of goat men, scalps and teeth a bit tedious... Of course it does progress beyond that, but I haven't got far enough to see how much additional depth is added to the game. Um, and I suppose if you're the sort of person who's really into the tactical side of roguelikes, the tactical depth and complex interactions between items and abilities, you know, the net hack school of roguelikes, then you might find Lava Walker too superficial and light for your tastes. Um, and it is a little bit. But at the same time, one of the great advantages of Lava Walker is that... Wow, that's a lot of enemies. Um, going to use my arrow to try and thin the herd a bit. There we go. Um, one of the great advantages of Lava Walker is that it's really easy to dip into, plays really smoothly, and doesn't require keyboard wrangling in the way that a lot of traditional ones do. Now, that's true of a lot of mouse-controlled roguelikes, but mouse-controlled roguelikes usually feel quite unwieldy in their own way, um, because people struggle to incorporate complexity of interaction into a mouse-based interface. Um, look at something like Tome 4, which is a good game, but I do find the mouse control a bit unwieldy. Lava Walker, on the other hand, because it doesn't aim for nethack levels of complexity of interaction, um, it doesn't need much depth or complexity of interface, so you can just play it by clicking on spaces, essentially. Um, of course, the presentation is very good. The sound is all appropriate without any overbearing music, like something like Here Be Dragons. And it, it just plays very smoothly, and while it doesn't have that depth and complexity of something like Net. Net hack. that does mean that it's easy to dip into for short play sessions, which is definitely an advantage. And it just feels so user-friendly and smooth to play that, in many ways, its lack of complexity isn't really an issue. Um, I can see that you might find the gathering of stuff like this a bit tedious. But if you're the sort of person who likes 
Um, I do want to say farming for loot, because there isn't really that much loot in it, at least so far. But the sort of person who doesn't mind, or indeed enjoys, the sort of Diablo torchlight, just almost mindlessly swatting at enemies and grabbing the stuff they drop, then you might well enjoy Lava Walker as well. And it, I, for its combination of smooth play, accessibility, easiness of dipping into, and just all-round user-friendliness, Lava Walker makes my top five 7DRL entries of 2014. I haven't ranked them in any particular order, but this is definitely in my top five. So, this has been Lava Walker. Thanks for watching, as always. Rejoin me the next time. Um, I will put a link below to Lava Walker, as I usually do. So, come back next time for the fifth and final choice from my top five picks of the 7DRL roguelike entries for 2014. Until then, bye for now.